Why I stay. Like all love-hate relationships, this is a complicated question. To be fair, though, it's not so much a love-hate relationship as it is a love-frustration relationship, bordering on love-anger at times, but not so much anger in the hostile and violent sort of way, much more like anger that is born of hope. As St. Augustine observed, Hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are Anger and Courage. Anger at the way things are, and courage to see that they do not remain as they are. Anger at the way things are, hope that things will change, and the courage to change them. The anger part of my relationship with the church would be fairly easy to document. Those who have ever had the misfortune of inadvertently lending me their ear at the wrong time and place will tell you that I have much fodder for discussion on this topic. Yes, I have a long, passionate litany of frustrations. However, they're chiefly frustrations born of despair and disappointment, the kind you get from witnessing firsthand the events when someone you love and care deeply about fails to live up to his or her potential. Indeed, my greatest fear for the Latter-day Saints is that their final epitaph will be, never before have so many done so little with so much. But while many are able to walk away from their frustrations with the church and find lives of happiness and joy and fulfillment on the other side, that's simply not an option for me. Articulating my reasons for this in a sensible, rational way is a challenge because in uh, one sense it's deeply ineffable. I can come close when I say that this is my tribe and these are my people. But it's more than that. It's where I find a legacy of overwhelming and dizzying potentiality. I owe my tribe not just my gratitude for this breathtaking cosmological legacy, but I also owe them my charity. And, of course, that charity is born of hope. As Moroni tells us, Behold, I judge better things of you. And again, I would speak unto you concerning hope. Wherefore, if you have faith, you must needs have hope. For you cannot have hope and faith, save you shall be meek and lowly of heart. If so, your faith and hope are vain. For none is acceptable before God, save the meek and lowly in heart. And if you be meek and lowly in heart and confess by the power of the Holy Spirit, you must needs have charity. For if you have not charity, you're nothing. Wherefore, you must needs have charity. And if you have not charity, you're nothing. For charity never faileth. Wherefore... Cleave unto charity, which is the greatest of all, uh, of all. For all things must fail, but charity, the pure love of Christ, endureth forever. And who fo- so is found possessed of it at the last day, it shall be well with him. Wherefore, pray with all the energy of your heart that you may be filled with this love, which is bestowed upon all who are true followers of his way. And, of course, that charity is born of hope, which St. Augustine tells us must be blended with courage to change things. To be honest, finding that courage for me has been the relatively easy part of this question because of the people around me at places like this. Years ago, I was fortunate enough to stumble into, although I more often feel like I bumble into, this most remarkable community of people here here at Sunstone. We have here, I believe, a remarkable and miraculous testament to the view that God moves in mysterious ways and cares for the honest seeker. Courage has been easy for me to find here because I'm constantly able to see up close and personal courage in the likes of people like Levina Fielding Anderson, Eugene England and his family, Michael Quinn, Janice Allred, Paul and Margaret Toscano. Laura Compton, and many others. How dare I complain about my treatment and disappointment when I see the integrity and genuine commitment to finding the design, the, the divine, in these siblings. So I stay in large measure because I find the courageous example of others, but I also stay not just because of courage for its own sake, but also for the courage that can motivate us to take action to change things. Naive? Perhaps, but even more than naivete, I have to admit that this is 
that in this regard I stay for reasons that it can appear to be somewhat arrogant because I also stay for much the same reasons as a physician who stays with a sick patient or keeps going back to the hospital week after week. I genuinely, genuinely don't mean any arrogance in this observation. I simply share that for whatever reason I find that I can operate somewhat in the role of uh, sort of organizational physician. But the corporate church is an unusually difficult patient. It's a patient in denial, like the alcoholic who blames the dysfunctional consequences of his al alcoholism on those who surround him. Hey, the problem isn't that I drink. It's that you won't repent of your wicked judgments of me. Besides, I won't lead you astray. I recognize that many do not have an immune system that can withstand constant exposure to the cancer of correlation. <laughs> For me, it's somehow just not a concern. Perhaps it's because the consequences they hold out as threats are really of no consequence to me. You cannot coerce or intimidate into submission somebody who doesn't really care much about what you think of them. I guess what this means is I can hang out at church without getting sick or weak or infected with the virus of church corporatism. Plus, I own a really cool smartphone. <laughs> and when I do get angry and frustrated, I feel compelled to take the onus upon myself to seek charity and patience and compassion. And when I strive this way with humility and real intent, I often find that I have to work at increasing my empathy rather than calling for justice and for others to repent. Believe me, the last thing I want in my life is God's justice. I see it as my responsibility to work to extend to my fellow Latter-day Saints the benefit of the doubt, which means that I have to be willing to concede that they have perfectly good reasons that make sense to them, whether or not they make sense to me, for the paths they've chosen, for the views they have, and for the beliefs that they claim. I also try to impart what healing I can. Along the way, I usually fail. I often treat people with a lack of charity and instead give in too quickly to the spirit of arrogance and contempt. But in the end, my arrogance and contempt only cheapen me and diminish me and retard my growth and development, not the targets of my arrogance and contempt. In this way, I also stay because the church acts as my refiner's fire. It serves me much in the way that those many little annoyances and unpleasant paradoxes of life serve all of us. The unpleasant stuff you don't want to do. The stuff that's unpleasant when you do it, but that ultimately you know leaves you better off for having done it, like exercising or flossing or getting an immunization or even a root canal. Yes, I said it. Going to church is for me much like getting a root canal. <laughs> a good, long, slow, painful root canal. <laughs> I stay because it is like an exercise routine. And of course, the best exercise routines are always vigorous and leave me spent. My church activity and, part and participation often leave me spent. It forces me to exercise the muscles of emotional self-regulation, the cardiovascular system of empathy, and to promote my immune system of charity and humility. It often and painfully shows me quite clearly that I am easy, easily guilty of the very intolerance, narrow-minded arrogance and judgmentalness of others that I am so quick to call out and condemn in others. It's forced me in a very real concrete and immediate way to set aside the intellectual pursuit of discipleship and instead find actual, practical, meaningful ways to enact discipleship as best and as impotently as I can, to find a way to respond constructively to the teaching of Jesus that we've all heard. You know, the teachings where we've been told that it has been, that it has been, that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall give the offense 
and try to dishonor and credit you by, oh, I don't know, let's say trying to openly marginalize you and offend you in Sunday school by giving you a public spanking, yes, on that cheek, for sharing your liberal views on social justice. I send you to turn to him that other cheek also. And if any man in your elders quorum or high priest group will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go to scout camp for a week, <laughs> go with him twain. <laughs> Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow gardening equipment and power tools of thee. Even though he quotes Rush Limbaugh incessantly and channels Fox News soundbite talking points at will, <laughs> turn not him away. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love the members of the Utah State Tea Party Coalition. <laughs> Bless them that curse you for not getting in line and following the brethren on Proposition 8. Do good to them that hate you for your sexual orientation. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you for your active efforts to find the mother in heaven that ye may be the children of your mother and father, which are both in heaven and yet have come to earth in the flesh to reveal themselves to you because you not, cannot travel to them. For the parliament of gods maketh the sun to rise on the evil and the good alike and send rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love only them who are liberals and attend sunstone and read dialogue, what reward have ye? Do not even the Republicans do the same? <laughs> and if ye salute your NPR and Prius driving brethren and sistren only, what do ye more than those who attend the fair conference in Sandy this weekend? <laughs> do not even the Pharisees in the corporate church do the same? Be ye therefore perfect in compassion, charity, and mercy, even as your Father and Mother in heaven are perfect in love and compassion towards you. You who did not, who could not, do anything to merit their unconditional grace and love. Wouldn't that be sweet? <laughs>